the guys. And the guys just like, they're like, come on, what happened? He said, well, she nagging me like she always does. I never take her out to eat anywhere. So I said, all right, we'll go to Joe's Pizza Place. I mean, come on, get off my back. So I take her to Joe's Pizza. We have dinner. And then I heard there was a faster way to get back on campus. So we start driving, and you know, I get totally lost around the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the country. I have no idea where I am. I'm just, I'm just driving. So it cuts back to her. And, and then the next thing is he stopped the car, and we parked. The beautiful sun was setting, and we went for a walk in the country. It was so perfect. And then he got down on both knees and asked me to marry him. <laughs> and so the girls are all clapping, and they're so, oh, that's beautiful. And then it cuts back to the guys. He's like... So, I'm lost in the country, I'm totally, I can't figure out where we are, and I run out of gas. Great. Just to make a bad night worse. So I'm like, come on, we gotta go for a walk. So we start walking, and it's getting, it gets dark out, and you couldn't see anything. And what I didn't notice is there was, is we're talking, and first, and she's just nagging me again. Now, why don't we get married? We've been, we've been together forever. I'm like, oh, stop. And I don't notice there's some roadkill on the ground. Maybe a groundhog sky, I don't know what it was, but I trip over it. And you know, I'm down on both knees. And I figure, might as well just do it now, and so I ask her to marry me. So that was the story. And again, that's it stuck in my mind. I loved it. You know, it's the guy versus girlfriend version. But you know, the sad fact is a lot of people have that view of marriage. You can see, oh no, man, that's too bad. Wow. Well, I want to tell you, marriage can be difficult. It can be hard, but it also can be amazing. It can be full of love and joy and times of real connecting. And so today, this is my last in a three-part sermon series on the Book of Song of Songs. So far, we've looked at this collection, collection of, of ancient poems, really. And we've seen marriage is beautiful. And then last week we saw that but it, marriage will never be enough. No matter how much your spouse loves you, no matter how much you love them, it'll never be all that you need. And so that's why we need God. But it is a great idea. So we turn to Song of Songs, chapter 8, beginning at verse 5. We see marriage has a math of its own. It begins by saying this, Who is this coming up from the wilderness, leaning on her beloved? Now this part is spoken by friends. Throughout, the, the friends speak, the, the woman speaks, her husband speaks. The friends are saying, who is this coming out of the wilderness, leaning on her beloved? So the image is, here they are coming, and she's leaning against them. They're arm in arm. They are in love. All you need is a sunset behind them, and it is a Hallmark card. It's a picture of intimacy, security. It's a portrait of a happily married couple. Why are they so content? The rest of verse 5 continues. Under the apple tree I roused you. There your mother conceived you. There she who was in labor gave you birth. Now, again, this is poetic. Remember, a lot of this book is symbolic. You know, you read poetry, and um, it doesn't always say exactly. It gives you pictures. And so, giving a picture here, the wife is remembering that in the same way her husband was born out of the union of mother and father, so now something new will be born of their love for one another. See, a great marriage creates something new, a unit that was never there before, something that had not existed. Sometimes it includes children, but not always. Remember from the beginning, God said that the, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one. So this mystical, metaphysical union of marriage creates a new identity. If you look up the word unite in the dictionary, you read it's to bring together to form a whole. And that's why the marriage of math is one plus one equals one. Now, kids, don't tell your math teacher that. They're going to argue with you. My dad was a math teacher. He would disagree. But the fact is, what God says is the two have now become one. In a successful marriage, the husband and wife stop thinking, what's best for me? And they start thinking, what's best for us? What's best for the two of us? Because they become one. You know, that's why divorce is so devastating. It's like taking two pieces of paper and, you know, putting that Elmer's glue you used to do as a kid. Remember how you thickly do it and then glue them together and press them together and leave them for a week and then try to tear them apart. It's going to be messy and it's going to be painful. And that's why what God wants is for us to be together because the two have become one, it says here. And marriage is all about oneness. That's what sets us apart from every other human relationship. The two people become one. Our kids, they grow up, they move away, 
Thank you for not saying praise God to that. That's good. I appreciate that. But someday my kids are going to be gone. Much as I love having my boys around, they're going to leave. And someday they're just going to call dad occasionally. But my wife and I have a different relationship that is ongoing until death does us part. So, the first thing we see is that math has its own marriage. And next, that it must then be protected. Verse 6. Place like a seal over your heart. Like a seal over your arm, for love is as strong as death. It's jealousy, unyielding as the grave. So she says, place me like a seal. Now back then they used seals to identify who it was. You probably see movies, you know, they'd melt wax. And you would put the seal in. Sometimes it would just be made of stone, even of wood. But it would let you know who it was from. It would let you know who this belonged to. And the idea is she's like, seal me on your heart. Make me the only one. She wants that closeness. The woman is saying he belongs to her and she belongs to him. Now it's interesting in the ancient world she's claiming ownership of her husband when the reality was in most ancient cultures men were more like the owners and got to do whatever they wanted. Women were expected to be faithful and to remember their marriage vows. Men not so much. But here she's studying the standard which is God's standard. That the woman's making demands of her husband asking for nothing less than absolute and undivided affection. She goes on and it says, For love is as strong as death, it's jealousy unyielding as the grave. Now that sounds strange. How is marriage like death? Well, it reminds me of the old joke. You know, studies have shown, have not proven that married men live longer than single men. It just feels like it. <laughs> well, when you look at it closely, you realize what a profound statement it's really making. Death is the only thing we can't escape. You might be able to dodge the IRS. You might be able to have your parents, they don't catch you, but death will hunt you down. And unless Jesus comes again, none of us are going to escape death's hand. As a matter of fact, in 2,000 years, no one has gotten away. See, it says here that the idea is this, that just as death is something you can count on, it's always going to be there, that its love is as strong as death. It says it's jealousy unyielding as the grave. And this is a positive time for jealousy. Not jealous about every little thing, but the idea is protecting the marriage. Marriage as God designs, it gives in to nothing and no one. It stands any test, time, temptation, troubles. It's the kind of commitment we read about in 1 Corinthians 13. Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. In an age when many people give up on marriage far too easily, we need to show people that marriage as God designed it is permanent. You know, if you remember our passage from last week, their wedding, their, after their wedding, everything has not been just perfect and everything's roses and chocolates. No, they've had some struggles. Remember they were kind of missing on each other. She opens the door, he's gone. They're having problems, and that's part of marriage. Marriage isn't always easy. There are dry spells and difficult seasons. Sometimes it's just the strain and stress of everyday life. Sometimes it's much more serious. It's prolonged, a debilitating illness chronic financial troubles, emotional issues, parenting conflicts. Husbands and wives, though, need to be committed to loving each other always, even through the difficult seasons, and to be relentless in pursuing oneness. You know, I understand in the fallen world there are times when marriages can be damaged by sin and so destroyed because of sin that some tragic choices must be made, but those have heartbreaking consequences. And that's why the goal of every married couple here should be to protect their marriage, that it be all that God wants it to be. You know, there's all kind of things that will get in the way of your marriage. Work, your children, a third party, fantasizing about another partner or another wife, addictions of various kind. And so in a great marriage, the partners are jealous of the affections of their loved one. They don't allow anything to come in between them. Not even their kids, as important as kids are, and as much as I love my sons, I've said to people, you know, as a parent, you've got to make sure you continue to love your spouse more than your kids. Because it's so easy, especially when they're young and they're so cute, and, well, they just love you and you're the best thing in the world. That'll end. But, um, <laughs> but when that's happening, you know, it's amazing. But again, someday my boys are going to move away. Their goal in life is not to live with their dad forever. Maybe until they're 35 or 40, but not forever. <laughs> So the fact is, couples fight to keep that love alive. 
and protect it. Protect it jealously. Don't allow anything to get in the way of that. You know, there's a time when husbands and wives need to speak to each other and really say, hey, things aren't going well right now. Things are not the way they should be. We need to do something about it. That's where you go, I'm done, I've just, I've had it, I give up. Now that's where you say, man, we've got to do something. Because I don't want to just exist. I don't want to be roommates. You know, fight for their affection, their loyalty. So, is there anything in your life that's threatening your marriage? Anything you're doing that's harming your marriage? What steps can you take to prepare a foundation that will be strong, that will withstand those times of real difficulty? Because when things come along like a horror, an illness that's just absolutely destructive, finances that are crumbling, children who are not doing well, the stress can really destroy a marriage. So you need to strengthen its foundations now. You need to prepare for all that's ahead. An older married couple made a video for their grandson who was getting married, and they gave him some advice on how to create a successful marriage. I'm sure they did not imagine, nor did they probably sanction their son, who sent it into True TV, who then aired it for all of us to see. So let's see a little piece of their advice for this soon-to-be grandson who will be married. Hi, Vince Sue. I'd love to give you tips to a long and healthy marriage. Be good to each other. I agree. Just don't argue with each other. If your wife... I, I don't argue with you. No, you do argue with no, me. No, you always pick on me. Well, I think yes. Here we are, the two of us together. Back to bed happy after our fights. <laughs> So take Kenny and Selma's advice, and you could be as happy as them. Don't argue with each other. He replies, I don't argue with you. She says, yes, you do. He says, you always pick on me. <laughs> but it's also so funny when she says, I haven't kissed him like that in 25 years. You know what else it is? It's really sad. You know, I thought, really? I mean, it wasn't like, that wasn't like some minute long, I'm embarrassed, like, please, Grandma, stop. I want to tell you, if you're married, I hope you still like to kiss the one that you chose to be your bride or husband. I hope you still enjoy holding hands. I hope you still enjoy more than that because that is an important part of marriage that God wants to be part of your life. Because the next thing is this. Marriage should be passionate. Marriage as God designs it should be a flame that never dies. Song of Songs, verse eight, chapter 8, verse 6 says this. It burns love like blazing fire, like a mighty flame. Many waters cannot quench love. Rivers cannot wash it away. So the love here, they're saying, between a husband and wife ought to burn. Sometimes it's going to sizzle. Sometimes it will just smolder. But on a regular basis, it should burst into flames. And the most remarkable thing about the Song of Songs is not the sexual imagery and intimacy. It's the passion that these two demonstrate for one another. Song of Songs is in the Bible to make clear to us that this is the kind of love and romance that God had in mind for couples. You wouldn't know that from watching movies and television. Again, on, in the Hollywood version, single people have all the fun. They're the one out there getting all the action and attention. And married people, it's boring. And you know what, friends? That's not what God meant for life to be at all. Brian Wilkerson says it this way. A great marriage refuses to settle for a predictable, passionless relationship. Husbands and wives find a way to get, to get alone together on a regular basis. They surprise each other with gifts, flowers, and phone calls. They make arrangements to get away for an overnight without the kids. They do their best to be attractive to one another, to affirm one another. You see, when you read the Song of Songs, you realize that sexual intimacy and, des and delight is set up by tender words and affectionate glances, and yes, even careful planning. So what can you do to stoke the flames of romance in your relationship? You know, guys, if your golf score is not good, you work on your stroke getting better. Ladies, you have your things to do. You, you want to get better at them. You work at it. Friends, marriage is work. 
You know, it's a myth that you're just going to get married and the rest of your life you look each other in the eyes and you spend every time at dinner going, oh, I love you too. Oh, no, I love you more. You know what? That's a piece of it. I love my wife. She loves me. I would not trade her for anything in this world. But it's not always easy. And that's why you have to work it. So what can you do to fan the, fan the flames? Even talk openly about this. You know, so often, husbands and wives fail to talk about some important things, like the passion that is missing. You know, early in Song of Songs, chapter 4, the new husband told his wife this. He says, how beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. Your eyes behind your veil are doves. Your hair is like a flock of goats descending from the hills of Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep just shorn, coming up from the washing." Each has its twin. Not one of them is alone. You guys, don't try this at home. <laughs> your lips are like a scarlet ribbon. Your mouth is lovely. Your temples behind your veil are like the halves of a pomegranate. Your neck is like the Tower of David, built with courses of stone on it, hang a thousand shields, all of them shields of warriors. Wow, you can just sense the passion in Okay. None of this really translates well into modern culture. So let me explain a little bit of this. Uh, he wasn't as bad of a poet as you might think. Uh, he says that your hair is like a flock of goats. What? Like a flock of smelly? No, the idea is, you know, long, black, this, this thick hair that's flowing. He says your teeth are like sheep that have been shorn. What? Well, I've got a little white, fluffy dog. And when he's really grown out and we haven't bathed him in a week, his hair gets mad and it gets dirty. But once he's newly cut and his hair is this long, and she has just bathed him, he is a brilliant white. And so what he's saying is your teeth are beautiful and white. He says everyone has its twin. In other words, you're not missing any teeth, which he's happy about. You know, that, that one matches with that one, that one matches with that one. That's a good thing. So again, throughout this, he's, he's trying to describe her beauty. I, I love, he says, your neck basically is like an elegant tower. How is that adorned with warrior shields? Well, again, this is a guy writing. I mean, you know, let's, let's face it. Uh, if a woman had written it, it probably would have been a little different. But the idea is a tower, something tall, so maybe a long neck. And it's adorned with warrior shields. Back then, that was a huge, if, you're, if your tower was adorned with what it says, I've got a lot of great warriors. For her, it's probably her jewelry. So all these things make her beautiful, and he wants to tell her about it. You know, there's actually an artist who gave a rendition. <laughs> Here is what she would literally look like if you, uh, if you drew her. Um, the nose, by the way, comes from a different passage. It says your nose is like a tower of uh, a tower of Lebanon. So uh, really, probably not straight, but but okay. This is an artist's rendition, but that's probably not what she looked like. I feel safe about saying that. So what, what, they continue, verse 5, he writes, your two, your two breasts are like two fawns, twin fawns on a gazelle. That's probably not the imagery that you would use to describe that particular part of the female anatomy. But in ancient literature, gazelles and deer were often associated with sensuality. And in fact, Proverbs chapter 5, verse 18 says, May your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. A loving doe, a graceful deer, may her breast satisfy you always. May you ever be captivated by her love. Now again, some of you are going, that's in the Bible? <laughs> Friends, the Proverbs aren't even safe. You know, you tell your kids, just stay away from that whole section of the Bible. That's just stuff you shouldn't be reading. Does this tell you something about our God and his view of the marriage relationship? You know, I'm embarrassed to read this to you, to be perfectly honest. And yet, this is important stuff for us to talk about. I'm really thankful my 13-year-old is sick this morning because he's not here to hear his dad talking about these things. But again, they're important to make marriage what it should be. See, throughout the ages, Christians have struggled with this whole idea. Down through the centuries, many theologians, as a matter of fact, have not liked the sensuality of the Song of Songs. And so rather than being what it is, simply poetic verses about love between a couple, they took everything and said, well, this is allegorical too. What this really means is this. So for these twin fawns that we're talking about here, they said, some of them said it, it, it's the Old and New Testaments. It's the kings and the high priests. The two stone tablets of the law are even the Lord's Supper and baptism. 
Now, how convoluted is that? Why did they do that, though? They didn't like what the literal translation came out as. They couldn't accept that the Holy Spirit of God would lead, have stuff like this in God's Word. But that's why the book is here, to show us about love. Verse 6 says, Until the day breaks and the shadows flee, I will go to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of incense. So until the day breaks and the shadows flee, in other words, night is over, day has come, I will go to the mountain of myrrh and to the hill of incense. Friends, he's not talking about staying up all night long and reading the Old and New Testament. He's looking forward to loving his wedding bride all night long. And that's okay. Matter of fact, it's better than okay. It's good. It's good enough that God put it in his word. Verse 7. Again, you are altogether beautiful, my darling. There is no flaw in you. See, the message of this book is that sex between a married man and a woman is beautiful. For some reasons, Christians have had a difficult time accepting this. For centuries, marital sex was seen as a necessary evil, permissible only for procreating and controlling unholy desires. St. Augustine argued that sex for any reason other than procreation was a sin. He said he wished God had never invented it. Married couples were taught that sex in marriage should be rare and restrained. You enjoy it too much, it's sinful. Celibacy was considered so virtuous, a matter of fact, that by the 12th century, it was decided that priests must be celibate. Did you know that for the first more than 1,000 years, pastors, priests, popes were married? Because that was God's original plan. But again, this whole view came that just all oh, that's bad and dirty. Friends, that didn't come from God. Later, the Victorian era, people covered the legs of their furniture lest they stir up impure thoughts. <laughs> people, if the legs of your furniture stir up impure thoughts, you have issues. <laughs> Don't even come to me. I'll refer you to a good counselor. But I have no <laughs> See, the thing is, Sexuality is good. It's something beautiful. And too often we get the impression that all the Bible says about sex is no. Friends, that's absolutely wrong. What it says is yes, at the right time, in the right relationship. When you're married, with your spouse, it's a good thing. It's a beautiful thing. You know, if you don't regularly read your Bible, you might be shocked to know that the Apostle Paul had something to say about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. It says this, beginning verse 3. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. Now friends, marital duty does not mean you go mow the lawn and I'm going to do the dishes. Okay? It's talking about the physical relationship. He says the wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Do not deprive each other. And again, he's not talking about don't, not feeding each other. Don't deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer and then come together again so Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Any of you didn't even know that's, you know, you've read through the entire New Testament, you never even saw that, did you? Friends, God views this relationship as important. Now notice here it says that they yield to one another. This is not the idea of forcing someone. This is not rape. This is not, this is in love saying, I yield my body to you. And in love, the other saying, I yield mine to you also. And that's what it's to be. This is not, you're their slave to every whim or desire. But it's understanding that sex is an important part of marriage and God wants it to be a part of your marriage. And let me tell you, that loving intimacy will help to protect your marriage will help to protect your loved one. Years ago, Deb and I knew a couple, and uh, they never, did not go to our church, thankfully. And uh, this woman, you're probably late 30s, she just belittled her husband, constantly put him down. And what she always told people, he was, he was overweight, probably 100 pounds overweight. Now, he was strong, he had shoulders out to about here, but, but he was a huge guy. But she always said, he's, so, he's just disgusting. I wouldn't touch him. She would say to his mother, to his siblings, oh, we haven't had sex in years. I'm not going to touch that guy. Oh, no. And she would say this repeatedly. And maybe six years after this, he comes to her and says, I've been having an affair for over a year, and I'm leaving you. And she was distraught and broken hearted. How could this happen? How could this happen? 
Now let me be clear, he was absolutely 100% wrong. It wasn't like, hey, she's not taking care of my needs, I'm going to go find it elsewhere. That is not what God's Word says. He sinned, and he was a Christian, and knew he sinned. You know, she was a Christian also, and do I think God also held her accountable for some of this? Yes. So you want to protect your marriage? This is a piece of it, is keeping that loving relationship strong. Passionately loving one another. Because if so, you're both going to be less likely to stray. And I want to say this, since I've been here, I have seen it as, as likely for the married women to stray as it is for the men. So guys, don't think, yeah, just she's got to worry about me. No. So protect your marriages. Paul says your body belongs to your spouse. Yield it to them because you love them. And let me encourage husbands and wives, cultivate this aspect of your relationship. Enjoy it. Explore it. And if you are not experiencing the kind of joy we read about in this book, The Song of Songs, then do something about it. Talk it over with your spouse. Read a Christian book on the subject together. If the realities of life are getting in the way, rearrange your schedule. Go away for the weekend. If there are deeper issues getting in the way of intimacy, go after them. See a counselor. Do whatever it takes. Don't settle for being like buddies. Like roommates. Maybe you share the same bed. Maybe you don't. Don't settle for that. God wants so much more for you. You know, he created marriage to be beautiful. You know, a lot of creatures, they, there's things that are asexual. They don't need another one. Why did God make it this way? Because he wants this to be a gift. Treat it like the gift that it is. Whatever you do, don't give up. Sex is beautiful. Now, I want to say this. Don't go home from here, especially if you're alone, and say to your spouse, you, by the way, need to. You may need to start building some bridges. If you guys don't kiss that, you're going to need to do that. Hold hands again. Start to develop the intimacy. Because God wants you to still look at that person and go, man, I love them. I mentioned a few weeks ago, my elderly neighbors in their late 80s, and you would see them out back all the time on that. They're little swinging, little, they had those little swings in back. They'd just be sitting there holding hands, talking. I hope that's your desire for your marriage, because that's what I want to do. But again, don't give up. And I want to say this. If you're young today, make a commitment to save yourself for your wedding day. Make a commitment to do things the way God wants you to, so it can be all that God wants it to be. If you're a single adult, don't give in to the peer pressure. I know everyone's doing it. It doesn't matter. As my dad used to say when I was in middle school, well, dad, everyone's doing it. You know, if everyone's jumping off a cliff, would you jump off with them? Of course, as a teenager, I'd say yes, but <laughs> no. No, you wouldn't. For those of you who made mistakes, receive God's forgiveness. Know that this is not the unforgivable sin. And ask God to cleanse you and make you new. You know, Song of Songs makes it clear God has something to say about marriage. Something to say to those who treat marriage like it's not important. Something to say to those who fear marriage. We need to tell people marriage, as God designed it, is a beautiful thing. We need to speak to a culture that's really decided, you know, marriage is too much work. Friends, it is a lot of work, and it is worth it absolutely and always. The idea of one man, one woman committed to each other, the two becoming one in permanent, passionate love. Song of Songs is a love song to be sure, but more than that, as we talked about last week, it's also a picture of God's love for us. See, the truth is, all of us at times feel unlovely, undesirable. We fear the longing of our heart might never be fulfilled. And then God comes in the person of Jesus Christ, who loves us as we are, who invites us to become one, one with Him, and it promises to make us one of His people. You know what? No matter how wonderful your marriage is, and I hope you have a great one. But even if you do, you know what? Your spouse will never be enough. And that's the problem a lot of people get into is they expect their spouse to meet all their needs. Young couples expect, when we get married, all my needs. No, there is no human being who can meet all your needs. There is no human being that can fill the void in your heart for love that God alone can fill. And so that's why as we love one another, and we love that one that God gave us more than anything, we also need to love the God who cared enough to give us good gifts. As I often tell couples in pre-engagement counseling, you know what, if marriage is like a triangle, God is the peak of that triangle. And you two are on the outside. The closer you get to Him, each of you, 
the closer you'll be to one another. If you both passionately love him, I tell you what, if you are passionately in love with your Savior, you're going to be a great spouse because you're going to be loving, thoughtful, kind. And you're not going to keep score. You're not going to bring a member five years ago when you said. So grow closer to Christ. Married, single, it doesn't matter. There's a Savior who loves you always. And today wants to be a part of your life. Let's pray.